recruit, and welcome to Astroneer Academy 502 Advanced Power Management. It has been well over a year since we last discussed power producers and consumers, and a lot has changed in that time. Exodynamics is constantly striving to bring us greater efficiency and innovation in all of the components we use on a daily basis. In fact, so much has changed that you can essentially forget most everything you learned in Astroneer Academy 103 because we need to revisit the topic entirely. There is a lot to cover, so let's get right into it. Power is still measured in units per second, and there are still five main categories of power producers. One of those categories, shelters, has remained unchanged. The other four, however, have either seen a bite cost reduction, crafting recipe change, or a vast increase in their power output. Some have experienced a combination of all three of these changes, while others may only have an updated recipe. One such item, the power cell, has only received an updated recipe. It is now crafted from a single graphite on your backpack printer. A power cell still stores 48 units of power and discharges that power at a rate of one unit per second until it is fully depleted. Once it is fully depleted, it is destroyed. Moving on to the generator category, both the small and medium generators are more efficient, providing 120 seconds of power production per resource nugget. The small generator has doubled its output from one unit per second to two units per second and is fueled by organic. This means a single organic nugget can yield a total of 240 units of power over a two minute period. The medium generator has a reduced byte cost, now only requiring 2000 bytes to unlock via the research catalog. Its output has tripled to nine units per second and it is still fueled by carbon. Each carbon nugget will provide 1080 units of power over a two minute period. While the increased power output and operating durations are very welcome enhancements, you will still need to ensure both generators are fueled by the respective resources to keep them running. You can choose to manually add resource nuggets as they're depleted, but that requires frequent interaction. Generators will automatically pull resource nuggets for fuel from any storage attached to the same platform that the generator itself is attached to. Of course, you can still use automation to create resources to fuel your generators and turn them off or on based upon your power needs. If you need a quick review of using automation in conjunction with generators, you can revisit the latter half of Astroneer Academy 306. The RTG, or radioisotope thermoelectric generator, has not received any changes, but it does have a new, adorable little counterpart. The QT RTG is a tier one size power producer that outputs a constant one unit per second. Unlike all other power generators, you cannot unlock it via the research catalog and you cannot craft it. Instead, Exodynamics provides QTRTGs via rewards for completing missions, and you can occasionally find them while exploring. You may encounter them on debris or inside of an Exo Research Aid bearing the Astronium resource symbol. The QTRTG was also offered as a reward via the Exo Salvage Initiative, and hopefully it will be offered as a reward in future limited time events. Wind turbines have received numerous enhancements, and we have two brand new turbines to discuss. The small wind turbine has seen a bite cost reduction, now only requiring 300 bytes to unlock. Its recipe has changed to a single ceramic and it is still printed on your backpack printer. Its power output has increased to 1.5 units per second and like all wind turbines we will discuss today, it only produces power when the wind is blowing. The medium wind turbine has an updated recipe that requires one aluminum and one ceramic on the small printer and its power output has increased to five units per second. The all new large wind turbine has a bite cost of 3,500 and is crafted on the medium printer from one aluminum alloy, one glass, and one ceramic. It will produce 10 units per second when the wind is blowing. Also new is the extra large wind turbine. After unlocking its schematic in the research catalog with 4,500 bytes, you can craft it on the large printer from one aluminum alloy, one iron, one ceramic, and one graphene, and it will produce 17 units per second. Well, it produces that much power if you deploy it first. Simply interact with it to deploy it, which will extend the turbine blades and the feet of its base. And that brings us to solar power, which can be a tricky subject. As we discussed in Astroneer Academy 103, various planets and moons all have varying levels of sunlight. As a result, solar panel output will vary based upon which planet or moon you deploy them. 
We'll talk more about this in a minute. But for now, we will reference solar output stated in the research catalog, which references medium levels of sunlight. There are now four solar producers you can create, starting with the small solar panel, which has had its bike cost reduced to 300. It is crafted on your backpack from a single copper, and its power output has doubled to one unit per second. The medium solar panel had its bike cost reduced to 2,000, and it is crafted on the small printer from one copper and one glass. It too has doubled in power output, producing four units per second. The all new large solar panel is unlocked for 4,000 bytes and is crafted on the medium printer from one aluminum alloy, one glass, and one copper. It will produce eight units per second. The solar array is still unlocked for 6,250 bytes, though its recipe on the large printer has changed to one copper, one glass, one graphene, and one aluminum alloy. The solar array produces 14 units per second when the sun is shining. And there is still a fifth source of solar power that you cannot craft, the wrecked solar array. You can find this power producer on the surface of most planets, though it can be easily overlooked as just simple debris. You can spot the wrecked solar array if you keep an eye out for its functional power cable. When the sun is shining, the wrecked solar array will produce a whopping 64 units Per second. If you want to incorporate a rec solar array into your power production, you can either run extenders from it to your base, or you can dig around it, freeing it from the terrain, and use a winch to drag it back to your base. Power can be stored for later use via small and medium batteries. The small battery has had its recipe for crafting on your backpack printer changed to one zinc. It will store 32 units of power and discharge that stored power at a rate of one unit per second. The medium battery still has a bite cost of 3,750 and it is still crafted on the small printer from one zinc and one lithium. But its power storage capacity has increased to 512 units and its output has increased to five units per second. Batteries can be an essential tool to provide emergency power when all other power sources are unavailable, but that is not the limit of their usefulness. We'll take another look at batteries in just a few moments. The final piece of a power grid that has not been previously discussed in any Astroneer Academy course is the power switch. The power switch is printed on the small printer from one copper and it can be unlocked for 750 bytes. As its name implies, this handy little switch allows you to control the flow of power through a single line. It features two power cable connectors on each side and a small power switch on top. It also has direction arrows to indicate the direction of power flow. This switch can be toggled by the various sensors, so we will be discussing it in that context in our next course. It can also be used quite simply as a power switch, independent of automation, allowing you to control the flow of power to one or more items with the simple flip of its switch. Understanding advanced power management is not simply about power producers and switches, however. To truly master power management, you must also understand each power consumer, and when they actually consume power. This means that we need to discuss changes that have been made to several power consumers. One item, the portable oxygenator, has received a welcome power consumption reduction, bringing it down to consuming just one unit per second. Additionally, Exodynamics has finally resolved the design flaw that previously caused the portable oxygenator to actually draw twice the amount of power than it needed. But the rest of the changes to power consumers are all, sadly, increased. The smelting furnace, large printer, and medium shredder will each consume five units per second. The soil centrifuge now consumes six units per second and requires roughly 15 seconds longer per production cycle than before. The large shredder will consume 7.5 units per second, while both the chemistry lab and extra large shredder have seen their power consumption increase to 10 units per second. Finally, the atmospheric condenser has seen the largest increase, with its power consumption jumping up to an inexcusable 20 units per second. And this is where you'll have to excuse me for a moment while I switch from imparting information to sharing an opinion. I can fully appreciate that Exodynamics is constantly innovating and bringing us greater efficiency. I am very grateful that their most recent overhaul of power producers introduced not only new power producers, but that many existing ones have increased power output while being more efficient. 
But it seems exodynamics got a bit carried away with their increases. How is it that the leading space exploration corporation can bring us more efficient power production while simultaneously creating less efficient power consumers? For most power consumers, the increases are not that all noticeable and typically will not have a huge impact. But for some of these changes, I think exodynamics needs to rethink their approach. How is it that the soil centrifuge now uses 50% more power Power, while also taking 50% longer to create resources. And why has the atmospheric condenser seen a jump all the way up to 20 units per second when it takes just as long to capture atmospheric resources? In fact, this can be said for all of the power consumers that have increased power consumption. How in the world did we wind up with all of these items suddenly requiring more power but gaining no greater production rates? The atmospheric condenser is simply the most egregious example, but I would expect across the board productivity increases from all power consumers if they are indeed going to consume more power. This is a huge mistake on the part of Exodynamics and one I hope their engineers are hard at work rectifying. Until these mistakes are corrected, astroneers everywhere have had their power management options limited. Instead of being able to pursue our missions with multiple strategies or designs, we have had several of those curtailed and we are now instead boxed in by these artificial Official barriers. I'm certain Exodynamics would point to data they have gathered, and they may have even held internal discussions on the matter. But data is never a replacement for the experience of astroneers who are pursuing their missions, and everybody knows that internal discussions is just another way to say we met inside of our own little echo chamber, and we determined that we made the correct choice despite feedback to the contrary. And that's enough ranting for now. Let's get back on track. Throughout this course, we have discussed the changes to power producers and consumers, but how exactly do we put this knowledge into practice and have advanced power management? The first half of the answer to that question comes in understanding the nature of your power producers, while the second half comes to utilizing the proper combination of power producers to meet the needs of your power consumers. Each planet has a wind rating from very low to very high, though this wind rating does not impact the amount of power each wind turbine can produce. Instead, the wind rating gives a general indication of the duration and frequency of wind on any given planet. So on a planet with a lower wind rating, you might not want to build out a wind turbine oriented power grid. But on a planet such as Glacio, for example, with a wind rating of very high, wind turbines can be a fairly reliable source of power throughout most of the day. But no wind turbine can produce power without wind, so you will always want to supplement your wind power with batteries to store power or or utilize other power producers to keep things running when the wind is not blowing. As mentioned earlier, each source of solar power will produce varying amounts of power based upon the sun level of the planet or moon. These levels range from very low to very high. On a planet rated very low, solar panels only produce 25% of their standard power. On a planet rated low, they will produce 50% of the power stated as standard in the research catalog. Medium rated planets will allow solar producers to output their full standard rating. On a planet rated high, your solar producers will output an extra 50% of power, and on a planet rated very high, they will produce an extra 75%. That means a wrecked solar array on Calidor, for example, would produce an absolutely staggering 112 units per second when the sun is shining. The graphic that you're looking at is also available in the Astroneer Academy textbook, which you can find a link to in the description of this video. Of course, solar panels do not produce any power at all once the sun is set, so you will need to implement power storage or supplemental power if you wish to have any productivity at night. And this is where batteries and generators come into play in advanced power management. When deployed in large quantities, batteries can keep a large base fully powered when other power producers are offline. It is entirely possible, and rather simple if you have enough resources, to create a power grid that uses nothing but renewable energy and batteries and never run out of power to keep everything operating. You will want to ensure your solar or wind power production exceeds the power requirement of all your power consumers, however, or else they won't be able to recharge your batteries when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. With proper planning and deployment, such a power grid will allow you to skip expensive RTGs 
entirely. Small to medium generators can also be a great way to supplement power production when there is no sun or wind. As I mentioned much earlier in the video, you can refer to Ashton Your Academy 306 for several examples of how you can automate not only the operation, but the refueling of generators so they will always be producing power when your wind or solar producers are offline. In such setups, you simply need an occasional resupply of soil to ensure your generators are available when you need them. But they do not have to be relegated to simply providing power when sun and wind cannot. You can easily modify such setups with additional power sensors to determine when a battery is being drained, which will indicate when your power consumers are using more power than is being produced, and then turn the generators on to provide supplemental power. Advanced power management also takes into consideration the amount of power production you need versus the amount of total space you can allot to power production. All tier one power producers producers are functional when freestanding or when attached to a platform or storage. When freestanding, each one has its own small platform built in, complete with two power cables. And tier one power producers are still typically the most space efficient of all power producers. By attaching tier one power producers to a medium storage or a medium storage silo, you can deploy eight to 24 of these tier one power producers in the same space as one single tier two power producer. So for example, you can have 24 small solar panels on a medium storage silo occupying the same amount of space a medium solar panel would require. The medium solar panel would only output 4 units per second, while the output of all the small solar panels combined would be 6 times higher at 24 units per second. That isn't to say you should skip using large power producers. Mass production of tier 1 power producers requires significantly more resources to craft not only the power producers themselves, but also also the storage to which they are attached. But tier two and tier three power producers do require a platform in order to transfer the power that they're producing to your power grid. The two tier four power producers, along with the wrecked solar array, do not require storage. In the case of the extra large wind turbine and the solar array, these come equipped with their own support structures that allow them to stand on terrain and power cables to connect them to your power grid. The wrecked solar array has no such support mechanism built in, however, so you will need to nudge it about to get it positioned where it is functional when the sun is shining. If you are struggling to produce enough power, you could easily set up a circuit of power consumers that you deem to have a lower priority, allowing you to simply cut off their supply of power when you need that power for higher priority items. For example, you could place your research chambers and a shredder on a circuit via the power switch and then turn all those off so you can use your soil centrifuge and smelting furnace at full power. Once your power output increases, or if you're not actively using higher priority items, you can turn the power on again by simply flipping the switch. You can also review Ashton Your Academy 103 for more information on utilizing extenders to prioritize which power consumers receive full power. And with all of this knowledge, you are now ready to utilize advanced power management to ensure you keep all of your power consumers fully powered based upon your specific needs. In our next course, we will take a look at how automation has expanded since we last discussed that topic in Ashton Your Academy 306. Until then, I'm Brandon reminding you to stay vainglorious.